How we got? What we got going on here? <clears throat> it is seven thirty. Welcome everybody that wanted to join. Come on in. Sit by the fire, just like David Koresh. <clears throat> I tell you what, we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about something that is uh, kind of near and dear to my heart. Matter of fact, it inspired a couple of books. And I see it um, as this thread woven through society. And particularly, I see it a lot in our society and in, in those folks that follow Ossetru and some pagan beliefs. I see an overriding and an overreaching idea of unearned moral superiority. And it drives me fucking insane. <laughs> life and the Love of Life, the book, was this. I had a unique idea. So let's say throughout time there have been disasters there have been radical things that have happened that that shed off lots of life people fell by the wayside the, the road to hell was clogged with those souls making their way to the afterlife the young and the old the ones with the knowledge and the ones who were supposed to receive the knowledge, or the fighting age men throughout time, starting at the Younger Dryas event, and perhaps going back to the one before that, which was 130 to 150,000 years ago. It's all so far away, it really doesn't even register in our mind what that might mean, does it? But let's say you, uh, let's say, let's go to the 18th, the 19th century, or the 20th century. And let's take a look at some of the shit that's going on there. Because when we get right down to it, there is no aspect of any society that didn't see a stunning loss of life, human life, valuable life, because someone decided they had a little bit more moral superiority than the next guy. Oh, says who? Who the fuck told anybody we have the moral high ground on any given issue? <laughs> 18th, 19th, 18th, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, Native Americans, South Americans decimated, wiped them out. We had the moral high ground. We had the right to do so because we were Christian at the time. We, you know, convert or die happened all over the world. Irish famine, the Holod the Holodomor, the the starvation of the Ukraine, the, 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 the World War I, the flu of 1918 that went around the world twice and picked on old people and young people. <coughs> and like I said, in World War I, then a communist revolution where Stalin killed literally tens of millions of people that didn't, well, they didn't fit his narrative. Communist China, the same thing. Chairman Mao, tens of mil hundred million people there. Pol Pot, all of Southeast Asia, all kinds of upheavals throughout the Middle East. Life becomes cheap. South Africa, in the middle of Africa, the Congo, five million people killed. Nobody better than I. World War II, the Cold War, Vietnam. This thing that's going on in the Middle East since 1947, and not, if, not, if not longer. <laughs> I said it last week, when we have a group of people that sit together like we do, and we stroke our collective egos about how much we don't like them over there, well, at the end of the day, we, we kind of owe them over there a debt of gratitude because it's allowed us to associate with each other. And yet, those people over there are doing the exact same thing. They're stroking their collective ego because they're better than us. Well, how do we rectify that situation? Well, we could kill them. 
because if you look at human history, that's been the fucking choice time and again. When I see the kind of radical statements that I see among people trying to get the approval of those that they would consider, well, cool. It astounds me that people still don't understand what I say when I say, don't lead with the chin. Don't walk out there and make some kind of dumbass statement and then whine about getting kicked off Facebook or YouTube. <laughs> I'll take, for instance, one where a lady said, drug addict parents should be whipped to death and left to bleed and die. My response was, you're going to raise their kids? You're going to raise that child who's going to remember watching their, what kind of monster do you think he's going to become? What do you think he's going to look like? If he grows up after watching his parents whipped to death for drug addiction, what kind of monster do you think he's going to become? You think you can handle it? You think you can change their mindset and really tell them, well, it was really in your best interest that we beat your parents to death and let them die in the street. That kid's going to grow up, and if he embraces this mindset, he's going to blood eagle your ass as soon as he's big enough. So we haven't really given any common thoughts to what damage we're doing to people. We didn't think about it in World War I. We didn't think about it in World War II. The communists, as they killed tens of millions of people, certainly didn't fucking think about it. Let me tell you about that. So let's say you're an average person and you decide to embrace an ideology that you believe gives you unearned moral superiority. You get a job as a guard at a gulag. Well, Things are kind of tight. Not a lot of money in the budget, so let's save some money. Let's don't use bullets. Four in the morning, you get these people who used to be your neighbors. You stand them up, you march them outside, have them dig a hole quietly because you don't want to scare the other people. And then to save money, you don't shoot them. You just push them in the hole and bury them alive. Now, here's the scary thought. All of us are capable of that. Every one of us, if we believe that we are right, every one of us, that we, if we believe we are in the right and we have the moral superiority and our ideology, ideology is the one that's going to most guarantee the success of our future, we will all do it. See, we haven't sorted our shit out yet. We haven't made the decisions about where we really want to stand with things. And we see people on Facebook every day talking about these kinds of radical actions as if there might be some legitimacy to it. We vilify and denigrate other people in the world because, well, we're a little bit better than them. How? Because we're willing to kill them? How are we better? Can you, can you fight better than Tyson Fury? Can you run faster than any of those world-class athletes in Jamaica? How are you better? Do you have more intelligence than, say, the, uh, some of the European Jews whose average IQ runs well above everybody else? Are you smarter than Milton Friedman? Can you hang in a debate with Jordan Peterson? How are we better? What makes us better? See, that's where righteous indignation comes in. I talk about it a lot. And people never seem to get what I'm talking about. See, if I'm righteously indignant enough about how right I am about a given issue, well, I'm willing to sacrifice certain aspects of my moral character in order to ensure that everyone understands just how right I am. That sacrifice might include up to and including the taking of a neighbor's life because they have a different political idea than I do. One of the great things about America is that that person also has a right to voice a political idea. It's essential. What's been going on most recently, what's driving people into the ranks of these alternative faiths and pagan ideologies is that more and more we are beginning to understand that that righteous indignation is the tool by which politicians and others manipulate the masses through the media. We see it with clear eyes. 
but we haven't sorted our shit out. We still don't understand what the value of that life is. We still don't understand what it means to love someone other than what we might have seen on TV or how good they are in bed. You see, that lesson is very clearly put out when, when uh, Scotty has to pick a, a, a spouse by looking at only his feet. <laughs> how many women today pick a spouse by looking only at the feet of their man? Now that foot is simply a representation. He's got pretty feet. It could be his bank account, it could be his build, it could be his face, it could be a number of things. And they're gonna pick that man on that one inch. And they wonder why the fuck it don't work. <laughs> so we haven't sorted our shit out. See, here's the thing. I wrote about it in Blind in One Eye. We're here kind of on this journey, right? Let's say you wanna go swimming. You decide to go diving and you put on a wetsuit and you and you jump on you jump on into the ocean and you swim around and you see all these wonderful beautiful things you see the violence of nature you see the shark eat the whale you see the octopus eat the crab you see all of these things and then you get out of the ocean you walk off you take off your scuba suit and you tell all your friends the wonderful things you've seen life is kind of like that as well isn't it <clears throat> Imagine going into the ocean and then deciding that shark doesn't need to eat that whale. I'm going to kill all the sharks because that's basically what we're doing. We're not here to, to tell everyone how right we are with regards to things. That's not our goal. That's not why we're here. I'm not here to sit here and tell you, well, I understand it implicitly the heathen worldview and based upon what I've understood about Tacitus and the other writings that I've read, I've got this very clear idea that if you don't pay attention to me, you're going to be wrong. And in being wrong, I have the right to denigrate you, call you names, ridicule you and run you out of town. <clears throat> don't you think we might be able to aim a little bit higher than that? Don't you think there might be something better to all of this? When a person is born in this world, it's like they're coming out of the ocean, right? They come out of the darkness, the dark comforting safety of the womb. They enter the world in the most violent of fashion sometimes. And we look at them and we say, how, what a cute baby. What a beautiful person they've become. And they grow up and they grow old. They get distracted by the shiny rocks. They get distracted to the left and to the right. They get pulled off of the path by righteous indignation or victim ideas or becoming a powerful ego or becoming someone they feel that, well, I'm important. Look at all these people think of me, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's a very seductive thing to have people talk to you and listen to you and willing to do what you say. It's a real art. People call it leadership. I was talking with a good friend of mine the other day. Robbie and I are of the same mind. Give us, each one of us, 300 men, either one of us, and we will convince those 300 men it is in their best interest to tear down the structure that, they, that they're all assembled in, chop it into small enough pieces, eat that damn thing, and call it good, and do it, in 100, and, and do it as fast as they can, and believe in it, and all the while, they'll think they're right. People are doing that now. Is that in the best interest of the people we're leading? to convince them to tear down these structures, devour them, eat them up, small, call it a good thing. Let's kill all of those people because it's a good thing they're against us. And if they were against, if they're against it, we, well, we have the right to do it. We have unearned moral superiority. And I see it all too often. When that baby comes into the world, we as parents have a magnificent responsibility to prevent that. The love of a mother is one of the most important things a child might ever have. <laughs> and it will continue throughout their adult. Their daughters will become their best friends and their sons will rely on it till the day they die. The bonds created between mother and son should be unshakable. And yet I see people now who would sell their mother if they didn't agree with them about who the enemy was. 
Should we be so callous, so carelessly sacrificing those bonds of familial love and friendship? That was Stalin's chief weapon in building communist Russia. <laughs> the legitimacy of killing tens of millions of people when the children would come and say, my mom and daddy, they quite ain't quite on board. They were gone. They were taken to a gulag, buried alive, left out in the cold to die. Who knows what? Same thing in communist China. The state, the government became the parental unit for hundreds of millions of people around the world. Whatever the state said, went. And I see people now willing to make that sacrifice. Asking for it, in fact. That's not why we're here to substitute the government for a higher spiritual purpose. We've been thrown literally a lifeline with regards to the development of our spiritual being with these old gods in all of the forms they've taken, be they Egyptian or Native American or European <laughs> or Middle Eastern or African, all of those various gods have thrown a lifeline to humanity to pull us out. Because if you look at the 20th century, it's been a nonstop roller coaster of the devastation of the world we live in and of the destruction of human life. Hundreds of millions of people have lost their lives for a governmental idea. And all, every step of the way, the people doing it fell right to do it. So let's say <laughs> underneath all of that, there's been an idea of hope. There's been a simple idea. It hasn't been grand. It hasn't been overriding, but it's there. And here we are in the 21st century, just now coming to the grips with the potential of what these indigenous tribal ancestral faiths might do to us. Blaine Qual said it best the other day. He said, every time you approach the edge of a wood, and I can't remember it exactly, but it was literary gold. It was beautiful. <laughs> At the edge of every wood is the beginning of a new horizon for our spirituality and our faith. A wide open place we might roam. I once heard it, I heard it best uh, wrote in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, the realm of the spirit is broad and roomy and inclusive. What a wonderful idea. Those are the kinds of ideas that allow us to cultivate bonds and strength of love, fellowship, frith, grith, all of it. There's no place in it for the radical ideas that I might kill someone because he doesn't quite believe in me. See, if, if you're bonded with a, a group of people and that group of people over that you're there because you hate that person over there or that group of people over there. That's the shallowest form of human association. Because if that group disappears, well, now what do you got? But we live in a violent world. We run the risk every day of being the person that thinks wrong or says wrong or believes wrong. The world, the preaching of the, the entirety of the history of preaching from the pulpit has been of one of, of moral violence. You don't believe as I believe, I might be right to kill you. Is that where we want to go with this? Is that what we're looking for? Yes, we should always be ready to defend those that we love with unyielding and unrelenting powerful action. We should never sacrifice that. We should not dust it off simply because they don't agree with us or call us a bad name or live in a way we don't approve of. Who are we to step up and say, you're wrong? Who am I to say that you're ugly and you're not worth living? Why, you weigh a little too much. You really don't deserve to be around here. Hopefully you get diabetes. <clears throat> Who are we to talk about that? Who am I to say such things? I haven't earned the moral superiority and I've done a lot. I've sacrificed a lot. I've given up a lot. I've suffered and I've succeeded. None of that 
gives me the authority to diminish or denigrate anybody else. As I was saying about the child that comes out of the womb, <laughs> there's something very special in that. And we say they're pretty, but there's an energy involved in the formation of life. Before that child crafted the suit that it's going to come out into the world in, it was simply a group of cells with energy driving everything, some kind of thing we call life, something very special. And it crafts a beautiful suit, most appealing to the parents that it is given to and it comes into the world and you have this new energy. And we say, well, you're pretty and that's pretty. Well, you might as well be saying, what a nice suit you have on. Because what you see with your eyes cannot begin to give you sufficient understanding of everything that is entailed with each person that you come across. When you get to a point where I don't have to make believe who you are, so I don't have to make believe who I am, so we can communicate with each other, we've gone a long, long, long way to handicapping <coughs> those ideas of righteous indignation that would give us the authority to hurt someone. And yet we're willing to do it in a heartbeat. Also true is a lifeline. If you begin to look at our gods, and Donna's the one that told me this years ago, and I never understood it till today. If you think of babies coming out in the world as some energy that's put on a nice suit that's associated with other energy in a positive aspect, there's a real neat thing that begins to happen because now we can begin to look at our gods and take the face off of that energy. When we begin to understand that there's a small slice of that energy within each one of us, it manifests as the thoughts that we think. It manifests as the actions that we take. There are these powerful, unyielding, unrelenting examples of individuals who have made sacrifice to become something better of themselves. And in that association of themselves, they create a powerful, powerful tribe built upon bonds of giving a shit about each other. And there's one asshole in the group. There's always an asshole in the group. And he's Loki. If you take Eager's Feast, when I wrote Eager's Feast, I put forth the hypothesis that at the table that we feast at, at all of the tables and all of the faiths, there's a faiths around the world, there is a table, there's a great feast, there's a lady with a mead cup, there's a queen handing out drinks to the honored guest. <laughs> In our thought process, if we can create a thought process with those wonderful, powerful, empowering thoughts of not pretending who you are, so I don't have to pretend to be who I am. I can create a table where those ideas and thoughts might be at home in my own thought process. I'm not simply trying to insert a positive thought process in an unrelenting stream of negative thoughts that are on autopilot that so many people engage in day after day. Failures, uh, flub ups, pain, hurt, some of it from many years ago. And it runs through our mind on autopilot and we feed on the chemicals all the time and we get distracted from what we're trying to do and we fail to become what we're supposed to become. If there's nothing that our gods have shown us, it is the sacrifice of that thought process. Get rid of it, set it outside, create a feasting table in your mind, in your thoughts that are continually positive. That is within you. That is the benefit of Greg giving these blessings to mankind, of Odin, Billy, and Vey giving these blessings to mankind, of Gethia and her bloodline is in all of this too. <laughs> of the wisdom Kavasir passed through the various kingdoms of the world. We all have it. And yet why are we so afraid to cultivate a positive thought process? We will allow Loki into the thought that one negative thought process that screws up the entire damn feast, one bad idea, one negative thought, and then we wonder why shit's not going right in our life. And then we say, well, it's their fault. Now I'm righteously indignant. Now I have unearned moral superiority. They must go. So I can, well, if they're gone, I'll be happy. No, you won't. You're still gonna be an ass. You're not gonna be any more right than you thought you were to begin with. And nothing has changed in your world. <laughs> Look at the sacrifices our gods have made. Tyr gave up a hand to, for the safety of his community. Not because he was afraid the wolf. Who else was going to do it? 
that great grandfatherly figure, that original possessor of Gungnir, the, you know, the original sky god, Deus Praetor, gave up his hand for the safety of his community. What are you going to give up? What would you sacrifice for the safety of your community? Have you built a community around yourself that you would even be willing to consider that? Or is your association with individuals nearest to you based on the shallowest form of human association? We have to think about these things if we are to be thrive and wisdom get. <clears throat> have you caused someone pain in your life? Are you willing to sacrifice the pain of those next to you or, or the happiness of those close to you just so you can, well, I'll be happy for a little bit. Sometimes we have to. Sometimes we gotta take a real hard, honest look. What kind of situation has the best thinking I could come up with put me in? Well, I gotta change my thoughts, don't I? I gotta set a new table for a new feast. <laughs> we are so much more than just the thoughts that we think. It's unimaginable to us at times. And yet we've got to begin to try to cultivate the idea that all of these thoughts are no more than birds chattering outside the window. We are so much more the energy behind the mask, the energy wearing the suit. Our gods are the same thing. That's how we can relate to them. That's how we can identify with them. But at some point in our growth and in our development, if we don't step beyond just the familial understanding and the basic and the routine observations of what's going on with these gods as they build a community and a tribe, we're missing the boat. And we will always be weak when it comes to the next idea that makes me the most righteously indignant and allows me to cultivate unearned moral superiority. <coughs> There's more to it, guys. This world is a world that couldn't give a fuck less whether or not you cultivate the gifts that you have. That they will sit at your table and dine the instant you build the best you can. There's a lot to all that. Also true is the best way to, well, for me anyway. See, there's some of that unearned moral superiority. For me, I have found that with these gods and goddesses of my ancestors. Yeah, they may be distant, but it's there. How are we going to cultivate that idea that allows me to want to do the right thing, even when no one's looking? How are we going to use these gods and goddesses to stand up and say, no, that's retarded. Why do you want to invite that kind of chaos into your life? How are we going to cultivate the courage and the honesty to tell others, no, I don't think that's necessary. I don't think that's good for our life. Well, you're not on board. You must be one of them. You're not on our side. It takes courage to stand up and say those kinds of things. I've done it for 10 years. I know exactly what it takes. And I could care. I'm still standing. I'm still here. I'm still number one at what I do. Sometimes we're not going to get that uh, second chance. Sometimes we're not going to get the opportunity to tell someone, you know what, you're important in my life. Sometimes we just don't get it. Sometimes we get wrapped up in ourselves. Unearned moral superiority is one of the most dangerous pitfalls that we face in cultivating this new faith. But it takes courage to step out of that thought process. It takes courage to say, no, that's dumber than a sack of cat meat. <laughs> because they will point a finger at you. They will point a finger at you and they will shake it and they will, well, they'll probably try to build a lot of success because they're making fun of you. I see people do it every day, all day long on social media. They will put something up about some person that doesn't quite fit the mold that they think should, should be there. And all of a sudden that person is ugly, hateful, and vilified. And well, 
I put it up there and I showed it to all of you and I'm therefore I have a better understanding and I'm just a little bit better. I'm so glad you paid attention to what I had to say. That person's bad. Thank you. We have a new bad person. We can all associate and hate that person. And now we're going to be along for a while. <coughs> Nobody gives a fuck what you think. I mean, we got to think about that. If there are 7 billion people in the world. If you're sitting there making a post like that to stroke your ego when you're sitting there not feeling very good about yourself and you get a hundred likes, that's not a hill of beans. That don't mean nothing. Who cares? I don't care if it's a hundred thousand likes. You still ain't touched one percent of the population of the United States. And yet in that, we will begin to consider how right we are and therefore <laughs> There ain't nothing we can't do, is there? All of a sudden, success is knocking at our door. Whoo, I'm gonna change the world. Well, that's a bit tougher to do than everybody thinks it is, because I've been trying for a minute. <laughs> but be that as it may, <coughs> these are the things we need to be paying attention to. These are the things we need to be thinking of. If we're going to ever offer legitimacy to this indigenous faith, to us, to any of these pagan ideologies, if we're ever going to create the legitimacy that we might sit at the table of the rest of the faiths of the world, we've got to step beyond trying to cultivate unearned moral superiority and righteous indignation as the hallmarks of success of said faith. That's going to take a little bit of sacrifice. That's going to take realizing Maybe I'm not as important as I thought I was, but you know what? I found myself surrounded by some really good people. I found myself surrounded by some really good people. Wow. What a wonderful thing. People that give a shit. People that will do what they say they're going to do. In a dangerous world, there's no stronger thing you can do than be willing to find yourself surrounded by good, solid people. That's where we cultivate the legitimacy of this faith and what it can do in people's lives. <clears throat> Nobody looking in of the, eight, of the 800 or so million Caucasians that this is the ancestral faith of, the ones looking in are not seeing that kind of legitimacy espoused. They're not seeing life-changing, powerful results that yield an individual who is unrelenting, powerful, steadfast, and everything he does, successful, that's not what they're seeing. Why is that? Why are we not asking the question of how come they're not seeing that? How come we are far too ready to say, well, they're just not woke. They don't understand that really it's, you know, the Jew or the Negro really has, you know, we're, the media is taking over. The media. You, really, you stuck your head in the sand and you just really don't understand. Well, they probably got a couple thousand in the bank, a line of credit, probably never had an interaction with a cop and <laughs> doing pretty good. Kids are in college, bills are paid. Why would they want to look? What are you offering? What kind of success are you promoting? What kind of happiness do you think might be involved? Oh my gosh. Well, happiness is, I don't know that we, we're not really... Oh, why not? Why can't you grab a little bit of that for yourself? Are you not worth it? If you're cultivating unearned moral superiority, probably not. It's probably not gonna be an aspect of your life. We've gotta ask ourselves some fairly hard questions with some of this stuff. And we're so far hesitant to do so because we're afraid of what people might think. Courage and honesty are at the top of the list of the nine noble virtues for a reason. Embrace them. Be courageous, be honest, and don't drink the fucking Kool-Aid. I think that's all I got. I'm glad everybody joined me. Lane, you joined up too late, buddy. <laughs> but, uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to discuss them with you. Yeah, I kind of figured I'd join too late, Brian. I'm sorry. I looked. I just looked at the clock and I mm -hmm. saw it was 9 p.m. Eastern uh, Eastern time, and I was like, "Dang it! I just missed the meeting." Hey, I'm glad you. Hey, I'm glad you joined anyway, man. You can be better late than better late than never. I can dig it. Yeah, I'll be sure to uh, go uh, on the YouTube and. 
Shoot, yeah, because uh, that was brilliant. I mean, that's the kind of. <laughs> I got to say that because I'm so full of shit, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, all right, well, I guess I'll get off here. And let, uh, Brian. Yes. So I, I messaged you the other day. My wife bought me a Kindle. Oh, yes. Did I not that, did I an answer? No, no, I. Oh, I don't shit. think you did. I... Well, I'll double check, man. But well, yeah, I got all of my books are on Kindle. I've uh, been man. trying to get a hold of Blaine for like weeks now, really? and find out what uh, books I need for the Gothi program. You know, uh -huh. give me an well, it ain't just one book. I promise. <laughs> you need, and for the AFA Gothi program, they really want you to be a member for two years. And then uh, it's a it's a mentorship, um, and there's several uh, there's several books, and they're and they're they're not easy reads either. And it is a it's a true mentor program. And yeah. so uh, once you once you get, and I will talk about this a little bit because it's one of the best things the AF, well not one of the best things the AFA has, but I'm I'm pretty proud of it, and I I was pretty proud to get mine. And, uh, Steve McNallan signed my first one. Matt signed the second one when I came back in. But that's, a, that's an in-depth, for me, it was two years with a weekly phone call and a discussion about what we read. There were several, I mean, just every week there was some, a report to write. Um, but we read a lot of the old, old texts, you know, ancient Teutonic priesthood, uh, culture of the Teutons, you know, just those are the basics right off the bat. Austro by Steve McNallan, the best primer I guess there is for for Austro in in, the, in its form. <laughs> um, the runes we read several of Edward Thorson's book. Although I will say that Diana Paxson's book on the runes is exceptional. Um, I know she's not necessarily the same mindset that I am, or a lot of people that listen to this, but she wrote a book on the runes, which I think is fantastic. Um, so, so don't hesitate to look at that. Um, I would have to pull the reading list up in front of me, but there's, it's extensive. There's, there's 30 books at least that you're going to read and discuss, as well as a worksheet. <coughs> you'll, you'll be invited to one of the big meetings, one of the big get togethers. You will lead a bloat, you know, and it's, it's kind of a thing when you, mine was at uh, Mother of All Moots. And uh, we were in, uh, somewhere near Napa Valley, it was gorgeous, but I got out there, we were doing the Wayfarers bloat. Dude, there was a hundred people standing in that circle, if not more. And it was a, uh, you know, me, I walked out there like John Wayne and then, you know, if I tripped and fell or my fly was open, the only thing I could do was just give it all I got, you know, yeah. but it, uh, it's, yeah. worth it. it's really worth it. And, and the mentors that we do have, um, they're exceptional. They are, they are good. They are good people that will, that know, know this stuff. You know, and there's always things you're going to learn. Um, that, I mean, that's really one of the most wonderful things about, about Austro, for me anyway, is that all of a sudden there's this brand new wide horizon that it never stops. Every day, if I'm paying attention, I'll see something new. I'll see some, I'll learn something and I'll read something or I'll, I'll figure something out or something will click. And it's, um, I think that's one of the neatest things about this path. <laughs> the Gothi program really gets you started, but it's uh, in, you know, in the ancient Teutonic priesthood, it talks about, you know, what Julius Caesar wrote. And we talk about Tacitus and what they, what that firsthand observation looked like, um, what they actually did, you know? And uh, I mean, that's where I get the idea that you have Odin and Frigga and they have Balder and, and, and he marries Nana. And then their son is Forseti. Well, Forseti, what does he do? He offers justice. He's the one that offers the most favorable judgments among men. The Gothi of the ancient tribes, he administered discipline. It wasn't the chieftain, it was the Gothi that administered tribes. And he got that authority from Forseti to create that fair, equal, balanced justice system. And, you know, if you look at the history of, of Northern Europe, you know, women could hold property, women had the right to divorce. We had more equality and, and freedom among the northern tribes of Europe, the foundational ideas of democracy that Thomas Jefferson incorporated into the Constitution of the United States, 
you know, these are the kind of things you're going to learn. And it's really, really interesting. You have two great ancient pagan cultures, the tribes of Northern Europe and the, and the democratic ideals of pagan Greece that created and founded some of the liberties of this country. There's, it's no accident that we are all in this country where we have the freedom to express these ideas without fear of, rec of recrimination. Um, you know, it, uh, it, it lends itself to an idea that I've become very passionate about, that, that, that inspires me to want to do better, to be better, to not pretend who you are so I don't have to pretend who I am. That's a real freeing kind of idea. Uh, there's a couple of people that I can do that with, and I, I, I love them to death. And it's, it's, been, a, <laughs> it's been a real, real rewarding experience. Um, but don't get me wrong. It's a higher failure rate than it is a pass rate. Yeah. Most people simply I, cannot. You know, I did the first two international Gothies students, one in Sweden, and he, he actually finished the course. <laughs> and the other one started in South Africa, but it's, it's so far, it's so hard to get some of the reading material. Um, so I trained both of the first two international Gothies for the AFA. Um, and both of them are very good men. It's interesting to see just exactly how different it is overseas. Uh, when, you, when you start talking about some of these things to a person that lives in Sweden, um, it's a little bit different. They have a different society. Um, some of this stuff never fell away. Yeah. Um, so it's... I mean, I'm not really expecting to, to, I want to do this. You know, I've always felt a pull to some form of clergy and I can, I can I mean, appreciate that. And I mean, I, it, it's not so much that I woke up one day and I'm like, man, I want to be a priest. You, you know, know, I've, I'm, I've I'm, just felt a, sorry, I, go ahead. I appreciate that, and that's a good call, and that's something you need to pay attention to, but I'm gonna be real honest with, about me and, and my path on it. When I first came into Ossetru, um, what are you supposed to look like if you follow this path? What's it gonna yield in your life? Well, see, there's a real unclear image there. Mm -hmm. So being a part of a, the largest international Ossetru organization in the world, you know, the first thing, well, if I, if I guess if I'm a successful, also true, I, well, I guess I'd be a folk builder. So I went and became a folk builder because I didn't know what else to be. I didn't know what it would be. I didn't know what it would be like to just be a regular person that practiced also true, that lived a good life. That was beyond my ability to comprehend at the time. Very much full of myself, still unlearning the old patterns of behavior that I had so vigorously engaged in that brought about my ruination. The next path, well, I saw all these people arguing online and uh, I thought they were wrong. Well, that dumb son of a bitch, he doesn't know, come here from Sikkim. Who's he think he is? I am a goat. <laughs> I'll tell you how it's going to be. <clears throat> it was a real stroking of my ego. That's, that's honestly where it came from. And but somewhere in there, there was also a desire to help. There was also something very special in all of this that I wanted to see thrive and survive. At that time, I was unaware of the literally thousands of elder heathens in the States who are simply happy and okay with who they are by themselves. They know enough people, and I promise you, there's thousands, tens of thousands of good people that follow also true. They're not a part of anything. They're just happy. They live a good life. They pay their bills. They raise their kids. They, they're exactly where they want to be. And ain't nothing wrong with that. And I think many of them are very beautiful people, you know, and uh, I've been fortunate enough in, write, in, in writing those kinds of ideas and expressing them on paper. Um, and I gotta tell you, that was probably the one thing that, that killed my ego more than anything. 
um, putting the very best thoughts I had on paper and then somebody coming along saying, you're dumber than shit. Who the fuck are you to write this? Uh -huh. <clears throat> I had to get better. I had to grow. So each book as I've written, I've, I've, I've worked hard to grow and write something more worth reading than the last one. If you read them, all of them, and that's, quite, that's a lot, you'll see, hopefully, that that becomes apparent. Um, that was probably the, the death of the majority of Mago. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm still pretty proud of my fucking self. <laughs> but, but there's, that's, that's what I, that's, that was part of my growth and part of my path. Yours might be wildly different. Yours might be entirely different. And who am I to say? I mean, and that's just the thing. I'm not anyone to say. I'm simply someone to say, well, why don't you go try it? Let's see what happens. Or maybe, you know, that might cause you a little bit more pain than you're ready for. Um, I don't know. They might be more than ready to sacrifice a hand. All I can do is offer the best advice that I can come up with. And sometimes that might simply be, man, brother, I got you. And it might be the best I can come up yeah. with at the moment. Um, <clears throat> so it's a real, it's a real solid program. I will say that. It's got, it's extensive, it's in-depth, and there are a lot of, <laughs> a lot of ideas that are involved in it, but it's really just a stepping stone because you're going to come across people as a go thief that uh, they might call you and say, Hey brother, I had a, I had the gun in my mouth just a minute ago. You, can you talk to me? I got all night, buddy. Yeah. It might be a woman or a guy that, you know, somebody has been fooling around on them and they walk in and catch them. And that's a real powerful moment in a person's life to actually see that kind of betrayal. Well, I've, I've been there. Well, I've, you, I've been there myself. Well, yeah. So when they call you in tears, you got, it's, it's not about, I, they don't give a fuck at that time about the Jew, the Negro, National Socialism, or Republican, or, or any of that fucking bullshit. Okay. What they care about, what they want to know, is that somewhere in this faith, somewhere in their spirituality, there might be some aspect of somebody sticking out a hand saying, come on, I got you. My gosh, man, that's the most important thing I've ever done is being able to do that for people. And it's, it's, that's why I'm surrounded by the good people I'm surrounded with. That's exactly yeah. <laughs> Because you gotta think about it, man. We're not really taught to love. Well, there's always conditions on that shit. You know, you got to look a certain way. You got to act a certain way. You know, if you don't eat with your, you know, right. Or there's always bullshit. I mean, think about a first date. You're going to be sitting there looking about that motherfucker just pick his nose. Are you shitting me? You know, there's going to be a bunch of things that you're looking at on that first date to see if I don't even want to spend any more time with this. Check, please. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. We, yeah. So we're, we're really taught to be on guard because we're always taught that somebody's going to take something from us. That's the overriding fear that, that governs the majority of human interaction. What are they trying to take from me? What do they want from me? If somebody yeah. walks up to you on the street, what's your first thought? Oh, what's this fucking want? You know, well, all of a sudden we're in a spirituality where it's like, it's not like that. All of a sudden we're in a spirituality where we're confident in who we are. We're secure in our understanding of who we are. We've cultivated our bodies. We've cultivated our minds. We've cultivated our spirituality. We need to start cultivating our emotional development so that we might, okay, how you do it? And not be afraid that somebody's going to take something from me. Yeah. <laughs> that allows me in certain circumstances, when people are in that kind of enormous pain, to not be afraid that they're going to take something from me. I can give them 110% of who I am. Take it or leave it. And if it don't work, it don't work. But maybe I can point them in the right direction to something that will. It's not personal anymore. It's simply giving the best of what I can be. 
that's, I mean, that's really the whole reason for all of this. You know, I may not be right about any of this shit, but there's, there's eight people right here that tomorrow are going to get up and, and fucking give it a hell. Okay. That's how we start. That's how we start, man. That's how you change the world. <laughs> and we live in a country that allows us to do that. We live in a yeah. world that allows us to do that. <laughs> I think we, I think we've got a winning combination. <sighs> So, I, I, you know, the go through program, if you want to consider it, you need to be aware it's going to be hard. It's going to be, uh, you're going to be stressful. <laughs> um, and you're going to be expected to follow through. And I don't think that, that that's always been, it's just hard. Because I'm going to throw, if you're, if you're my student, I'm going to throw some of the most complicated spiritual ideas at you that are going, you've ever heard. Yeah. And I'm going to ask you to write about it and then we're going to discuss it and then we're going to go over it again. And then we're going to say, how can I put this into practice? What good will this do for me to know this? How best will I be able to empower someone to become something more without me becoming something better first? Yeah. So, and it's hard, but even a, even an encounter with a good go with one that really gives a shit, that one that really knows what they're talking about, that doesn't have a foundation in uh, being right. You, it's a benefit. It's, it's what we need. And this is, you know, the AFA has a long-term plan, man. You know, they really do. And, and I know what Matt does, and I, and I know he tries hard. And I know he tries fucking real hard. And he stresses about it. And he fucking, I'm pretty sure he loses sleep over it. And now he's got a baby on the way. Um, but we want this to be something better. We want this to be something for people. <clears throat> We're all going to grow in one way or another. Um, some of the things you've heard on this channel are going to be better than what you learn in the Guthy program, simply because I'm fucking Brian Wilton. <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> right. Yeah. But you know, uh just figure out why you want to do it. Figure out why you want to do it. Start reading. Just start reading, man. Read religion of the Teutons. Read culture of the Teutons. Find the ancient Teutonic priesthood. Read, study the runes. Um, do not think of the runes as a shortcut to power. And that's the biggest, my biggest hesitation with teaching people the runes. People that have not shed themselves of those various injuries and weaknesses that we accumulate in life, find the runes and begin to imagine that they have the keys to the universe <laughs> and that they might be able to alter the patterns of their life with these and their personal growth stops. You see, but they never remember that Odin fell shrieking from a tree after he'd been hanging pierced in the side, at the edge of death itself, sacrificing his ego to learn those runes. And it's, we have to kind of do the same thing, guys. We kind of have to get rid of some of those ideas that make, it think, make us think it's okay. And he lost his entire kingdom. He lost his fucking temper, lost his entire kingdom, lost the damn war, got his ass, I mean, somebody spanked him. And he had to go wandering. How many people go through life and somewhere in the middle of their life, they just, life just kicks them right in the square in the balls. Here I am yeah. doing everything everybody said I was supposed to do, trying to do the right thing, and I just can't keep it together, and it's falling apart, and I can't help the people close to me that I love. Fuck it, I'm going to start drinking. Well, now I'm drinking, now I'm a drunk. Now you, well, now let's do little drugs here too. Oh, shit, that's a line. I'll take that. Let's go on. Come on. And it just keeps going on. <laughs> Next thing you know, you're at the bottom of the barrel. Nobody fucking likes you. You're broke. You're alone. Hell, you might even be in jail. Yeah. That's where you learn the rooms. After you've lost it all, after you figure out, I got nothing left. Everything I thought was important about me didn't mean jack shit. That's where you learn the rooms. <laughs> and that's uh, what people missed. The uh, books that you were talking about, the religion of the Teutons, what were the other ones? 
Uh, culture of the Teutons. I think both, the Teutons? both are available as PDFs online. Uh, Religion of the Teutons is from 1902. It's written by a Saucier, S-A-S-S-A-U-Y-E. And the me and Brandy had tried to read it, and it's just it's just in depth, man. It's 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 just hard. We're, she's she's pretty fucking smart, man. And we were both looking at it, going, God dang. <laughs> right. But uh, but that it, book just takes you. That book just takes you down too many rabbit holes to stay concentrating on. Boy, it does, uh-huh. doesn't it? I mean, the footnotes themselves are this wealth of information. That's that's where I learned that by the 17th century there were a thousand books on the mythologies of Northern Europe. A thousand books already. <laughs> Every one of them written with, a, with an agenda in mind. Because if you wrote the wrong thing, see the first one was written during the burning of the witches, the, the witch burnings in Europe. And all of a sudden this guy writes a book, Elves, Fawns, and Fairies. Well, that's an important book. But, <clears throat> um, yeah, there's there's a lot, man. I'd read I'd read my latest one too because it'll blow your lips off. It'll be on audiobook pretty soon. Brian's finishing up the uh, last couple of chapters on uh, Turabok, and it'll be I, I'm hope hopefully he'll have it in the next week or two. But he's he's always done pretty good for me. It's just very hard to read. Yeah, editing. I, I just figured I'd ask since I got you right here. Uh, one last thing I'd like to ask about uh, before I stop asking any more questions and let you get off. Uh, earlier, you were talking about Forsetti. Yes. You know, and, and Justice. So would he technically be the, the deity of Justice? Yes. These people that call on Tyr, um, it says in the edit, Tyr is not known to be a reconciler of men. He is not known to be a reconciler of men. You got to be a savage son of a bitch out there and hand, give your hand on the, for the benefit of your tribe. You've got to have a set of nuts to put. You need a wheelbarrow for. That's not the kind of guy that's going to give a fair and equitable justice. He's going to look at one guy and say, "You're right. You're wrong. You're fucked. Get out of here." All right, come on, you win. He's going to settle in the most violent fashion. But he is a figure of authority. Uh-huh. He is that figure that makes sacrifice. But for Seti is the God of justice. He is the one that offers the most fair and equitable treatments. It's the same principle at play between Odin, Frigga, Balder, Nana, and Forseti as it is in the three generational aspects of the Rig Thula. The great-grandparents, the grandparents, and the parents. They have a son who takes a wife, correct? Each generation. Uh-huh. That son and wife have a bunch of children, and for that age, for that timeline, and there's it might have been a thousand years apart for each one of these visits, but they are named great grandparents, parents, grandparents, and parents. People have tried to use that to justify Dumazel's concept of you know of men and how they operate in society. I think it's complete uh, refutal of that of Dumazel's ideas of first, second, and third man operations in a society because it calls them great-grandparents and grandparents and parents. The race of Thals and all that bullshit, I think that's an extraneous addition for the 10th century. <clears throat> the children of the son and wife have names that are influential, important, and those are the kind of characteristics that build the very early civilization, the middle civilization, and the high civilization, uh-huh. and eventually become kings in their own right. It's the same principle at play in Asgard, as above, so below. And I know that's, I know that's going to get under some people's crawl, but that's the, that's the truth of the matter. <laughs> um, I can't use it any other way. It has no value to me if I use it any other way. Or race of thralls. What fucking good is that going to do me in building individuals who are not willing to engage in righteous indignation and develop a spirituality and faith that are going to be able to take care of each other. One's always going to say, well, I'm a little bit better than you because you're just a thrall. Fuck off. So that's, yeah. Forseti is a God of justice and equitable settlement. He's the one people need to be calling on. 
So Forsetti and Tier are not the same people then? Fuck no. Okay, 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 okay. I was, I was, just, <laughs> making, I was just making sure. <laughs> There's, there's some Bronze Age rock art in Sweden that shows a one-handed one god holding Gungnir. And if you look at the migration of peoples and the development of faith, and I don't buy the Aryan myth at all, but I do see people go here and people go here, an aspect of faith being in here. Deus Prater, this original sky god, and he, that's why he is the North Star, Tiu, Tiwaz, Tiu. He is Deuce Prater. He is the North Star. He is the guiding star for princes that he never fails. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of why he is always looked at as the God that offers settlement. The king renders judgment. But that wasn't the way it was for our ancient ancestors. It was, uh, it was the Gothi when they were separate. We had the Gothi and the chieftains, separate but equal. They each had their roles and responsibilities in the community. Uh, the Gothi administered stripes, especially for cowardice. If you were a coward in battle, it was the Gothi that would string your ass up um, mm -hmm. or make you leave the village or something, or you'd be outlawed. That was the Gothi responsibility, not the chieftains. The combination of the chieftain and, and Gothi came much later with the advent of Christianity across, across Northern Europe when the Pope began to offer great monies. And then you had a very unique thing happen you had the class of priests begin to develop. The king had all the authority in the role, but the bishop still had the same kind of authority as the king, didn't he? He just yeah. kind of flip-flopped. And then a regular man who might not ever have any hopes of becoming anything more might enter the priesthood, and every week he would lead the flock, and he had the chance conceivably to become a bishop or a cardinal and rival kings and emperors in Europe, and never cultivate the ideas of royalty that were commonplace in the royal houses of Europe. And so you had, you had corruption, you had the burning of witches, and that, that's kind of the tale of Sif. When, when Loki steals Sif's hair, it's, it's symbolic of a rape. Think about the beauty of a woman. Her face, clean, pretty lines, beautiful eyes, lovely hair. If you were to take some beautiful aspect of a woman, you'd shave her head fucking bald, wouldn't you? And this is the rape of the divine feminine. Um, payment of that is an interesting thing. If you think of Loki as the Pope, this deceitful character talking to the the downtrodden and the blind and the people at the edges of the crowd and garnering support from the weak-willed sheep that need to be led in every community that exists. All these gifts are given to all of these great royal houses. Odin gets Gungnir, Frey gets the greatest of all ships, Thor gets a great belt of gloves and a hammer, um, and Sif gets this golden hair. So there's a story here that there's this powerful reminder that the women of royalty of these royal houses were not to be fucked with, but these commonplace women or well, the church had free reign to destroy them. So the church gave great powerful monies, wealth and standing to the royal houses, supporting their kings, even if they were corrupt, leaving those women alone. And they, they were given free reign to ravage the countryside to root out pagan ideas. Uh -huh. It's just a theory I have, but it seems to make sense. Um, so there's, there's, there's some of that. <laughs> but be that as it may, I think I've yammered long enough. Really good, really good stuff, man. I mean, that's the thing. You, 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 there's no, you won't stop learning. You'll see new things. You'll grow. You'll develop. And there'll be some new idea. Somebody will show up in your life. And they'll tell you something fantastic. Or somebody will show up in your life and they'll say they'll give you some love when you need it most and or they might just give you a little support or they might give you a kick in the fucking ass and sometimes that's all we need yeah. so <laughs> anyway i'm going to get off here i appreciate everyone joining me and i hope all of you go out tomorrow grab life by the nose and whip its ass thank you for all the information brian all right, very informative you. thank Have you a good one sammy says bye bye we'll see you guys later 
Later. Night, Brian. Later.